Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a second on today's session around how cyber insurance can help build a strong MSP ecosystem. Um, this is part of our series that we've done with Gradient and ourselves at Nodeware to talk specifically about how does the MSP ecosystem get stronger? How does it get more productive, more efficient? Um, to be able to handle all of the things that are coming their way. Uh, the opportunity for small businesses uh, to ask more questions, to need more assistance as the world moves from kind of IT oriented support to cybersecurity support. Uh, this is a series of conversations that we have. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a second. We're just waiting for some of your colleagues to log in and then we'll go ahead and get going. Um, in the meantime, you know, be thinking about questions that you want to ask. Uh, we will use the chat box uh, or the question box. Uh, feel free to submit them there, and we will uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, before we get into today's session, let me go through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, once again, as always, you know, we want to keep these as uh, as interactive as possible. So submit your questions. Um, also, if you have uh, additional topics. Uh, the folks at Gradient and uh, and the folks at Nodeware together, we are going to do more of these sessions about helping the MSP ecosystem become stronger, being more secure, being more effective, more efficient, more productive. So if you have different topics that you'd like to hear about this, we just did one last month around assessments and how the assessment world has changed dramatically and what's required to do holistic risk management and to do assessments and the integration of assessments uh, to the continuous monitoring that comes out of Nodeware to the immediate alerts that come out of Nodeware, integrated into Gradient, integrated into your billing system, integrated into the PSAs that you are using um, as a way to provide you know, a real productivity enhancement. If you see other topics or other speakers you'd like to have in that series, you know, Matt and I would be interested in hearing from you as to what you'd like us to talk about um, and what sessions and questions we ought to be covering. If we can go to the next slide. A couple of things from our side, you know, we, uh, we are focused heavily on public service announcements with SMB leaders. And uh, the next session we have is coming up on the 15th in a couple of days on increased compliancy and cyber attacks. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have Chris Weiser and Dave Sobel with us being talking about, you know, what's going on in that marketplace and what's happening and how are compliance affecting what MSPs do, how they react and what are the, uh, you know, the small and medium businesses that are outsourcing their IT and cybersecurity, what kind of things that they need. And then as always once a month, uh, we have a session uh, on a Nodeware live demo and peer Q&A session uh, where you can ask any questions about your product, uh, hear how different people are using it. Uh, some of our partners from an integration standpoint are heavily involved. Uh, you might have just seen we announced a press release the other day with a number of our integration partners, including Gradient, including SciSurance, uh, and we'll talk more about that on the 29th as well. So with that, um, I wanna get into today's session specifically. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have Matt with us. He's the Director of Security at Gradient. He's also been in the MSP marketplace uh, for uh, you know, a significant portion of his career. So uh, Matt, let me, uh, uh, if you wanna say a few words, a little bit about your background and your perspective on this topic, and then we'll move to Kirsten. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you, Stuart. So <clears throat> as Stuart mentioned, I am the Director of Security at Gradient and, that encompasses uh, internal security, uh, compliance, and some of our software security as well. And prior to this, I spent about uh, 10, 11, 12 years, something like that, in the MSP channel industry, working for an MSP and doing both client work and, and also uh, internal uh, information security and compliance for a, a pretty large MSP. So I've seen this from, from a couple of perspectives. One, both how the how clients uh, interact and their insurance needs and how that's changing. And also from the perspective of the, the leadership and business of an MSP and their needs as far as coverage. 
Perfect, Matt. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us on today's session, and I look forward to doing this on an ongoing basis with you as we talk about the the evolution of the MSP MSSP marketplace. Kirsten. So yes, well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so for us, with with cyber insurance, we're we're really looking at is how we develop and support an integrated approach between analysis of networks and insurability of clients. So you know, for me, I've had a long history of risk management and cybersecurity, you know, threat intelligence, threat detection. And for us with Cyassurance, it was trying to integrate that approach to understand how we can integrate and support true risk management with technology integrations. And with MSPs particularly, they own the customer. You know, at 83% of small businesses outsource their their, their security and infrastructure to MSPs. And for a while, for financial professionals like accountants were the only group that exceeded that number. But now actually for the technology infrastructure and digitalization that we have seen post COVID, that number now solely belongs to the MSP community. So there's a tremendous opportunity to help evolve these small business and small enterprise customers into a different way of thinking and to grow businesses. Um, in this hard insurance market, there is a lot of question, fear around, can we get people insurable? What does it mean to be insurable? Can I as an MSP become insurable? So this discussion today will be about a little bit about the market and why the market is so hard in terms of reduction of um, available capacity in the market for limits, the increases in premiums, and how you can actually leverage that information into being more effective in developing a security posture for your customers who are in your infrastructure and how to reduce the very impact of events. Great. Well, it, look, we are fortunate to have both of you with us today. I mean, I think we ought to just, I think we ought to start with the obvious question. You know, cyber insurance has changed dramatically in the last, you know, six to 12 months. The number of attacks are up dramatically. Um, we've seen people, you know, that used to do, uh, you know, vulnerability management scanning on a quarterly basis that are now being told if you don't do them during normal business hours every day continuously, you know, you're not meeting the compliance requirements or the regulatory requirements or some of the NIST framework requirements or SIS 18 requirements. You know, maybe Kirsten, just talk a little bit about how it's evolved over the last 12 months, why it's so difficult for people to get, you know, renew their insurance or maybe to get insurance. And maybe we start with just the landscape. Um, and if you want to elaborate a little bit about that, and then Matt, you can talk about, you know, some of the things the MSPs are doing because of some of these issues. Yes, well, it's been an evolution. So for quite some time, and there are many people who are probably on this event that could get insurance, cyber insurance very easily. And that was what we referred to as a soft market. And there were lots of people getting lots of type, different types of insurance policies. They were quite inexpensive. One of the big shifts that happened was in 2017 with NotPetya. That was kind of a, a, an awakening of, uh-oh, there's actual real risk in this cyber thing that we have insured across the board. And that was interesting because you had very large corporations that had very substantial losses, but you actually had a lot of small organizations that started to experience losses as well. So this was where everyone kind of perked up and wondered what was going to happen. But then as we continued to evolve, what we started to see between 2017 and 2020 was that the small business customer literally increased claims activity and attack activity by a thousand percent over their much larger peers. And so for a conversation that many of us have with the smaller organizations that don't really feel like they're a target, they don't feel like they have much that people want to take from them, this has been, been quite a rude awakening for them as well. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to evaluate, but also to look at after 2020 with very substantial ransom attacks that happened. And we certainly know what many of those were, but also for small organizations, what we have seen is that not only have the ransom attacks accelerated, the payment amounts accelerating, but also the losses accelerating in terms of just breach notification losses and exfiltration concerns. And so now what the market is shifting to is a, a very serious consideration around the, now we're gonna deal with potentially having to pay a ransom, we're dealing with remediation costs, and now we're dealing with 
breach notification requirements and much more stringent regulatory framework like California, New York, that's all, right, starting to have minimum damages. So these are all drivers that are impacting the ability for people to become insurable. And so what happened in the last two years, and, and to your point, sort of the last 12 months, is that it's really contracted in the cyber insurance market through a variety of factors. Probably 30% of, of especially small organizations received non-renewal letters where they just couldn't even manage to, to have the minimum requirements or it was viewed they didn't have the minimum requirements. So we've seen a lot of people who just are dealing with non-renewals. And we're seeing it particularly between 50 million and 200 million in annual revenue that that's a, a real particular concern. And, and these are people who have some maturity in organizations but really need additional support and, and support and in, in effectively growing the organization. So it's becoming a, a constricting point for organizations to grow. But also what we're seeing is that the limits that people need, so there are people with contractual requirements, they might be $5 million in insurance. Now the market is saying you can only have two or three. And so that's another contraction. And the other piece of it is reduction of coverage. So now you have policies, if you have a million dollar policy, you might only have half a million dollars in ransom coverage or even a, a co-insurance feature, which means you have to cover the first 500,000 before insurance covers into the last 500,000. So there are a number of components that are happening in the market that are creating a lot of confusion for organizations and also the confusion of, am I actually compliant? And so these are the components that I think, as it comes back to the MSP conversation, because these organizations kind of own that customer, what can MSPs do to help verify and support both the renewal process, the application process, in a time when many of them don't know the answers themselves or are struggling with their own insurability? So these are all components that I think are, are worthy of discussion, but also just to sort of set the table for how we got here and what the primary challenges are. So Matt, from your perspective, you've been in the MSP industry a long time, you know, how, either how have the MSPs or how should the MSPs be thinking about all these fluctuations? How do they support their clients? How do they educate their clients? How do they take on new clients? And, uh, and how do they make sure they, they too, as an MSP, are insured with the work that they're taking on on behalf of their clients? Yeah, what a great question. And there, there's a few directions that this can go. So, so responding to directly how things have changed over the time I've been in the industry, it, you know, it, it went from <clears throat> a general understanding that you were pretty secure and taking care of things to these now detailed, extremely detailed audits and questions and questionnaires about what you have and what your clients have. And there's there's a tendency to almost see it as an adversarial relationship between you, the MSP, and the insurance carrier. And it, you know, it, it, it can be a strange feeling for technical organizations to suddenly feel like they have someone looking over their shoulder, especially if they're in industries that aren't used to heavy regulation. Um, you know, depends on what you were, were in before. What, what I'm seeing is almost a butting of heads between the security guys in these organizations and the people responsible for compliance, right? And, and I don't, don't just mean strictly regulatory compliance. I mean, in the sense that the security people are saying, we think we're set up already. And, you know, we have these insurance people saying, you are not set up correctly. Your clients aren't configured. You don't have the right controls in place. And, and that, divide can be pretty significant and it's been an adjustment for the industry to try and see that as a nice reminder of things that need to happen or a way to verify the things need to happen versus the, this kind of adversary working against you. You can feel like it's really uh, kind of an antagonistic relationship when, when I don't think it is. I haven't seen any questionnaire that I shouldn't say that I have seen some pretty bad questions. Um, but some of them, or for the most part, they're reminders of things that you should be doing in the first place. Um, the other thing that's been difficult for the MSP industry is an education component to clients, right? There's been this understanding and this expectation that you as the service provider are taking care of all of this, right? And, and the client just sends over the questionnaire saying, 
hey, just fill this out. You know, we, we assume you're doing all this already. And it can turn into a pretty difficult conversation uh, when it gets into, well, you're, you're not doing these things and we told you you should do this thing and, and you didn't do it because of cost or some other mitigating factor. And here's what you have to do to get from here to there. It's really been an adjustment and the start of some difficult conversations around the industry. But I, I think ultimately, uh, if once we get through this, it'll be in a, a good direction. Hey, Kirsten, to that point, maybe you can elaborate on, you know, you guys have provided cyber liability for clients of MSBs for a long time. Um, maybe elaborate a little bit on, you know, some of the things that have come out of that and how the MSBs have had to evolve while providing that cyber liability for their clients. You know, as the world's changed, how do the MSBs need to adapt to that? Well, you know, for, for a long time, I've worked with a lot of MSPs who have evolved in their stack, right? They were infrastructure, they were break fix, they were a variety of different solutions that evolved into adding security services. And I think that that's really just becoming table stakes for these organizations. And, and I talked to a number of organizations who will say, oh, we have 500 customers. Well, how many do you have in your security stack? 30, right? And so it's really trying to help support them into how do we, we help them set standards around that. And so it's part of some of what we've done with our Protect program that integrates like a service warranty type product to help not only the customer feel value in those security posture, but also to help create additional value and support around these things actually work for you. But to take a step back, I also think there are two components, one in cyber that we have lived with forever, which is you know, the, the proving the negative conversation, right? Which is, if you haven't been attacked, it's because we're so awesome at what we do, or we're so lucky, or whatever, I fill in the blank, anything you want to say in that line. But the reality is, is that we need to get comfortable with not zero, right? And I, and I think that a lot of MSPs still really struggle with if something happens, if there's an incident, a cyber incident, my customer is going to leave me, which I, I don't think is true. What I think is a really big educational component is these things happen and they will happen, just like car accidents happen and house fires happen. But there's been for a long time a, a unique expectation for us in the security community to be at zero. And I think this is our opportunity to reset that and really start to reflect on frequency, impact, and severity. And so... I, I like to use the sort of car analogy, which is right now we have all these cyber totals and we need more cyber fender benders. And I think that's really where MSPs can be effective in showing that, you know, the good, better, best version of these things or for organizations that have minimal budget versus organizations that have more budget. Here's how I can get you a seatbelt versus an airbag versus lane drift versus. So these different components that aren't only help you qualify for insurance because that's important. But at the end of the day, we really want our customers to be secure. I mean, that's, that's the objective. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's kind of the teaching to the test thing. We've talked about this for years around the different standards and other things. It's supposed to help people have guardrails. But we want our customers and want ourselves to be safe and to help people understand MSA works because. And firewall rules or, you know, whatever thing that we want to implement that we think is going to be effective for those organizations, these things actually help you recover faster because ultimately rapid recovery is what limits losses. You raise a really good point. I'm sorry to cut you off, Stuart. I, no, I don't mean to. Um, the, the idea that as an MSP, you should be afraid of a client leaving you for an incident. I, I can say anecdotally, I've never actually seen that happen. Um, in, in most cases, both the, the client and the client's insurance or incident recovery firm is grateful to us, the MSP, for having been able to help identify the incident and having tools in place to be able to help their forensics team perform their investigation. And, and you know, that's, that's a whole different discussion, right? The impact of insurance on incident response, but setting the expectation that there, there's the silent yet after you haven't been breached, right? You haven't been breached yet, or you have been and don't know about it, it is um, changing, right? And it's it's a sign of a mature organization to be able to have that conversation with your customers and make them understand that there there's really an inevitability to this, not just a, we're going to keep it a zero forever. 
you know, it's it's interesting. What I was going to say was, you know, when I first got uh, to Nodeware about a year and a half ago, I thought we would only sell Nodeware to MSPs that had never run a vulnerability management scanning tool. And what's happened in the last six months or so, 12 months, is we've had so many MSPs that were running traditional vulnerability management products monthly or quarterly. And that was the model they had. And, and they would take a snapshot on a Sunday night or some point in time, and they would say to their clients, here are the products that you have that are vulnerable, and here's how we're going to go about fixing them. And now the clients are saying, look, if you have critical data of mine, and you're not scanning during normal business hours every single day doing continuous scanning, we're no longer going to keep our data with you because our data is too important to us. And we need from a from a availability, from a uh, serviceability, from a business continuity standpoint, we need you to do continuous monitoring on an everyday normal business hour basis. And it's changed the way people think about it because of the increase in attacks. And it's changed because of the regulatory or compliance requirement that say, if you're not doing continuous monitoring, I don't feel like we're safe. And I think the insurance company is kind of going through that same scenario, right? Of the frequency of what needs to be done by the client or by the MSP to make sure the insurance actually kicks in when something happens you know, is much more stringent than it used to be. And the last thing someone wants is a surprise, right? Here I have insurance. I've been paying these premiums. I mean, this is the, the, the biggest rub of what I hear from people around cyber insurance, which is, oh, well, something bad's going to happen to me, and then they're not going to cover it anyway. And and that's not true. I mean, in fact, the the truth is quite the opposite, but there are there's a lot of sensationalism around all these variety of things that you read about in the press where they say this incident wasn't covered or this thing didn't happen. But the reality is it was because their coverages weren't right. They didn't have the right controls. Like they said they had something they didn't have. And the one of the most interesting one is the Travelers case right now where there was an organization that had a fairly significant ransom attack and, and with also a business email compromise. It was a $2 million loss. Travelers paid it. And when they went to the investigation, they discovered that most of what was on the attestation is marked yes, wasn't installed, wasn't running in that organization, and Travelers is now suing that organization to get their money back. So the fact is, is they're paying very close attention, but they should be, right? These are contracts, and the thing that people need to remember is that these are insuring agreements, and they're, con and they're considered contracts between you and the insurance company that are enforceable, just like every other contract is enforceable. Matt, maybe you could elaborate on, you know, from an MSP standpoint, you know, what are are the MSPs, you know, either getting smarter about it? Where do they go to get smarter about it? How do they do a better job of uh, of making sure they're advising and implementing what their clients need to stay, um, you know, in compliance with the policy? Yeah, that that's a really good point, and. And, you know, one of the things they hopefully are not doing is saying that something's implemented when it isn't or trying in any way to pull one over on, on your auditor. I can't even imagine uh, doing that, the, the type of integrity breach that would be. You know, really, this is one of those cases where, um, you know, the, the InfoSec people listening are going to, to butt heads a little bit with the compliance people. And the reality is what you need to be doing is what your carrier says you need to be doing if you want to continue coverage. And, and while your info set guy might say, well, you don't really need to do that, whatever, the, the reality is if you don't, your coverage might not be there. Or, so as far as how to become educated about that, how to, to figure out what you need to do and how to implement these kinds of things, um, the, the reality is a lot of it or, or none of it is anything that's different from normal security best practices, right? These questionnaires are very long in some cases, but I haven't really seen anything that's unreasonable or anything that's um, not good security practice or good risk management to begin with. And if for any typical or, or any item on these questionnaires or anything that you should be or asked to implement, uh, chances are somebody in your organization knows how to do it, right? I mean, if if you've never heard of something, 
Um, you, you may need, you may have a staffing or educational issue. You need an introsec protection practitioner on staff, right? There, there is no silver bullet if you don't have any security expertise in house. But assuming you do, uh, or are in the process of becoming educated on that, there, there's resources out there. It's pretty, uh, I don't want to say easy, but the information is there to be found. You know, uh, Kirsten, maybe you could, you know, getting back to the questionnaires and uh, and all of the things that are in the questionnaires, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, some things that you guys are doing from an integration standpoint to take, you know, the output of Nodeware, to take the output of some assessment tools that are out there today, integrated, that fully integrate into your questionnaire that give the MSPs something they can get you know get started with that gets them significantly on their way to getting that questionnaire through your system and then uh, and then and then matt maybe we can talk about how that output of that questionnaire could be integrated into gradient into the billing system into the psas to really enhance the productivity of the msp but kirsten i'll let you go first yes well so the continuous monitoring element is is really key and and particularly around vulnerability analysis because one of the things that we haven't touched on is the evolving nature of risks in our environment and it's one of the things that's unique to what we do in our world as security people different than i think physical risk and we although we do see new changes around um, some of the hurricanes or other activities that we were a little bit unaware of that are changing in our environment, but this will be our state forever, right? A, a, a bank robber gets better at what they do all the time, even though we get better at defense, right? And so one of the things around vulnerability analysis is also really at trying to identify state change because part of it is looking at the current state and whether you're currently compliant, but it's also assisting and helping to understand when some, like, because there are people who can be compliant today, but some vulnerability researcher, so a black hat will be identifying a vulnerability that tomorrow is now going to be exploited that isn't your fault. And these are the areas where I think it's, it's particularly important because when we look at indicator, indicator of compromise incident, how quickly can we remediate between indicator of compromise and incident? And those are things that I think as we evolve in the insurance world, that these will become more valuable. And so what we're trying to do is take this type of data, vulnerability data, and then sort of current state data, you know, firewall settings or NFA or, you know, fill in the blank, the kind of normal things that you would have as controls versus watching then network traffic related to those controls and translating that into insurance data, right? So are there insurable events happening? Are there potential insurable events happening? Because not every incident is an insurable incident. And I think that those are the pieces that we can really bring together that enable us to be more effective, not only in showing that someone's compliant or if there's a gray area where someone's hit with the vulnerability or they have a vulnerability that's compromised, we can show, look, they were compliant with everything. It's just that the adversary evolved more rapidly than someone else, but we were able to remediate rapidly because. And I think that those are the things that in the holistic view are so critical to what we do in a combined joint effort to help support organizations. And I think that really fills out the compliance discussion and the defensibility discussion around whether organizations are doing the right things and whether their, their security practitioners on their behalf are looking at the right components. Because we know that prioritization of those indicators is always one of the biggest challenges we have. And so I think a lot of these tools that we have, especially around Nodeware and others that really help surface those key indicators but then help us move forward. And, and then that data evolves such that we can take that back to carriers and underwriters and say, we're catching things at this point in the attack cycle because we're looking at this, this broad set of data. And those are the, the value points that I think are really essential to, to bringing together a better visibility and understanding of contextualization of that data that, that translates into what the insurance carriers can understand, but what MSPs can action on in real time. So, uh, Matt, I, we just got a question on the chat box about uh, from an I assume it's an MSP that's saying if I want to if I want to get insurance for myself or offer insurance, 
um, as a broker to one of my clients? How do I go about doing that? So, so step one is to find an insurance carrier that that can help with you that you have a good relationship and um you know kirsten's a, a good expert on something like that we we had just through a, an insurance carrier that we happened to work with at my previous organization that was willing to work with our clients but it needs to be someone who who understands the msp world and the type of liabilities that you're getting into by servicing customers um you know, uh, offline we can come up with some specifics or uh, find out who, who we used. I don't want to name anyone specifically on on the webinar, but it, the the key is just making sure it's a carrier that truly understands the the MSP industry and is is willing to work with you in that capacity. Kirsten, anything you want to elaborate on that? Well, sure. I mean, there are also like our platform. You can find customers using our licenses so our platform is regulatory approved for that sort of thing we have separate products that bundle that move people up the stack so there there are a variety of solutions and certainly there are organizations who are trying to find ways to help support msps and and also help to ensure msps specifically because you know obviously you want to set your own table before moving on to others and certainly there's been a dynamic change i don't have to tell anybody in this call about how MSPs are being scrutinized or cha having challenges in insurability. So you know, we have markets that we we look at specifically to help support MSPs. It's um, the challenge, I think, for a lot of organizations is just the cost. But the fact is, is that the cost is kind of what it is in the sense that you really just should not go without insurance. I mean, that's that's the worst thing that could happen, especially for the ENO component. And this is something I try to emphasize a lot, which is it's not just the cyber insurance piece. It's making sure that you have the errors and emissions that help support you in things beyond cyber because, you know, if a server blows up and someone goes down or a variety of different components that are, are far beyond just even an outage or, or a ransom attack, that these are elements that protect your organization and defend you in the event that something were to go wrong. You know, maybe you could, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that, you know, we have MSPs that support, you know, K through 12 and higher ed and cities and counties that are now considered critical infrastructure that need to do certain things in order to be insurable. And, uh, and maybe, that's a, maybe that's a big challenge for the MSP to help those uh, entities get to a point where they need to be. Um, you know, maybe you could elaborate a little bit about, you know, the critical infrastructure, the need to be insurable. And if you're not insurable, what does that mean? Yes, and we work with a lot of organizations, both MDRs and MSPs who support K through 12 and um, municipalities specifically. And the challenge is when you're critical infrastructure, one would say that now more than ever, you need insurance. And yet most carriers actually have them on the list of app outright declines, right? They won't even consider them. There are certain organizations who will, um, but one of the things, of course, is to be able to develop the package that shows that there's a there's continuous monitoring and availability of that and, and redundancy off, off also for those types of organizations. I think redundant systems and endpoints are really, really, especially for K through 12, endpoint management is like hands down a, a very key thing. So those are those are areas where one might look at alternative risk management opportunities, um, but it's and, and joining with certain organizations who can help support the insurability component because it, it's an interesting element when, when those organizations are resource constrained and trying to become insurable at the same time. So there has to be some level of creativity and ability to look at things in a different way. And, and so with MSPs, and we work with a lot of MDRs also, because the, the being able to show that there's continuous monitoring, and this is like the theme of the day, I think, that I, I just believe that services with technology, as we go forward, will always have to be integrated in some way, especially for these types of organizations, because it provides that backstop that enables to have a much more comprehensive approach to risk management, where I think they'll become more and more insurable. Because just with the, the municipalities as an example, there were so few security controls in place 
for many of these organizations, just due to budgetary constraints, that it created this really challenging market. So I think, you know, for many of us you know, who are practitioners and insurance people at the same time, it's really trying to prove to the market that they are secure. And of course, they're targets, but lots of organizations are targets, but they were targets because they had different levels of security. So I think it's, it's kind of a push-pull, um, finding the right partner, but also making sure that you can show that there's a continuously monitored environment and that there's continuous improvement where you can look at indicators and, and remediation so that you can build that, that book around proving that those, those controls are being, they're, are, they're actually effective. Kirsten, that, that leads me to a question that I've seen come up occasionally. If you are an MSP with a client uh, like that who's currently not insurable, what do you do? Are, are there liability concerns for yourself and your own organization during that period? Do you kind of just uh, wipe your hands of it and say, Let, let's, you know, you have to do these to get to the point where you can be insurable? And, and what's the risk for you as the service provider during that period? Well, there are a couple of things. Um, one is in, in the insurability. There, there are certain um, carriers who will insure them. They could have very limited coverage, so that's one area. So just having a, a, a good broker partner who can look at a variety of markets so that you can get that in place, and you can also carry more than one policy that helps augment different coverages, so that's one area. But the other area that I think both related to, to the, the specific conversation, but also broadly, is that carriers are reducing coverages and in implementing cover coverage requirements. For example, a 45-day patch cycle. And so one thing that MSP should be very concerned with is to discuss with their partners, their customers, what sort of policies they have in place because there may be um, sandboxing of patches that last longer than 45 days because you might have a manufacturing environment where it takes longer than 45 days to roll out those patches. You have to test them appropriately. Unbeknownst to the MSP that there's a contractual requirement in the policy that says if you have patched in 45 days, you have a 25% degradation of coverage that, you, that degrades down to 75% loss of coverage. So those are two components to think about. One is how do we make sure that we can look at many markets to find the right insurance for organizations that are very challenged in this environment? And the other is to make sure that you have clients who don't have very specific requirements in their policies that could trip you up from a liability perspective if you weren't aware of that, where now you're liable, right? You rolled that patch out in 60 days. There were good reasons for it, but, but if an organization were attacked in that period of time, they could actually lose coverage. Again, that's why E&O coverage is so important, but, but beyond that, also being really on the same page with clients who may have those types of requirements. Let's, uh, let me talk a little bit more about, you know, um, the NIST framework and SIF-18 and some of the different cyber frameworks that are out there now that a lot of um, either industry groups or, uh, or industry verticals are now looking at as, you know, how do we improve our business policy, business practices connecting to those frameworks? Can you talk a little bit about the effect of those frameworks have had on the cyber insurance industry and the requirements and, uh, and things that MSPs need to be aware of, uh, once again, to, to provide a solution for their clients? Yeah, tech, tech response is one. So, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I, I think we're, we'll, we'll probably say similar things. I know from the the MSP world, the the frameworks are becoming something that we're being asked about now, which is fantastic. It, it's awesome for clients to be talking about CSF and, and other frameworks with us. Um, but but one of the big benefits to at least the, the more comprehensive frameworks, right? If you if you implement everything in 853 or if you implement everything in CSF, um, you are very, very close to being ready for any insurance questionnaire that's going to come your way already. And, and it's just, you know, one of the rare things that gets you both a security and regulatory benefit simultaneously by going through one of those frameworks and modeling your own program around them. Um, so it, it's been a, a huge, Net positive, and, and I really am enjoying seeing the adoption of some of these as far as 
MSQs putting together their stacks, right? There are conversations in the community such as, you know, what are you doing for this item in, you know, framework, whatever. And that's just really, really cool to see from a security perspective that um, it's not just this thing that comes out when audit time comes around. It's something that's really being used as far as day-to-day -day planning of program management. And uh, the, the fact that we're doing that and that clients are asking about it, uh, to me, that that's a great thing. Absolutely. And, you know, protect, detect, respond is, is like the, where you want to start. And, you know, I've, I've had some people say, well, you know, NIST, it's, it's okay. It's really complex. It's, you know, but they have the small business framework. They help with prioritization. And one of the key things with the NIST framework, especially for the small business group, is how you prioritize some of the key points to be able to become effectively managing your environment quickly. And, and, and I, and that's hundred percent right. These things do help you not only be more secure, but they already sort of self fill the answers to those questionnaires. And, um, and, and they're continually evolving to match up with new technology, new implementations, you know, more cloud environments. You know, I have a lot of people ask me, what happens when I have a fully cloud environment? And they ask me about my firewalls, right? What, what do I say on that portion of the questionnaire? And so those are things that, that I think NIST is continually aligning with. And then you have like the frameworks around Cloud Security Alliance for organ both vendors as well as, as users who um, so it's really helping to align for this really dynamically changing world that we live in, especially for small businesses who have an absolute need to get to a whole digital footprint very, very quickly that um, to enable to be competitive in their own businesses. So, Matt, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how, you know, with things like you know, the continuous monitoring and the immediate alerts. And we're obviously fully integrated into Gradient and Gradient fully integrated into the PSAs and the billing systems and the ticketing systems. You know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about how that integration and that continuous monitoring, those immediate alerts are assisting, you know, MSPs by using Gradient to help them be more productive. Yeah, that, that's a really great point, Stuart. The the idea of being able to get immediate visibility into not just the, the billing side, but the alerting side that comes out of Nodeware and continuous integration allows you to, again, satisfy regulatory requirements and insurance requirements and be proactively secure. You know, if, if you're looking in real time at new information coming into your PSA about a new vulnerability that was found, you can have somebody on that immediately working on it within, you know, a few minutes of the issue coming in, as opposed to having to log in and look at a summary report or parse an email report or something like that. It's, it really changes the way that you can react to that. And, and it takes it from being able to say to your insurance carrier, yes, I have continuous integration, uh, to being able to actually have it and act, make it actionable and do something about the issues that come in. You know, it, it, it takes you from the, yes, I satisfied the criteria to, I feel like I'm really doing something about mine and my client's security. Does it also allow you through the, you know, if an MSP is using the ticketing system from a PSA with the gradient interaction and connectivity, does it allow you to get all the way into that ticketing system to be able to, you know, notify the client that way? Well, well, that would be something that that's configured in your own ticketing system, right? So the ticket comes in and you can have, depending on your, your PSA, it might be called a, a workflow or a sequence or what have you, uh, events that trigger and fire based on something coming in. Um, so, so your clients then can have some assurance that things are really happening without having to log into their ticket portal or wait for the monthly report or even worse, call you and ask you, what are you guys doing for us? Right. And, and Kirsten, I would assume the same thing through, through the, the nodeware output and through the assessment output and the questionnaire and the integration into Gradient, the same thing happens, right? They have the ability to get notified through their ticketing system of an event, of an issue, of a 
a potential risk in their insurance renewability or uh, um, or a premium acceptance, if you will. Yes, and my hope is that with this, these integrations, we're able to build a continuous underwriting package. So at the end of the year, instead of having to fill out yet another questionnaire, we can actually build that questionnaire around the activity, to how quickly it was remediated, so all those events that enable us to really show not only are they compliant, but they are continuously adapting and changing to the threat landscape and the attack surface being potentially penetrated. And so those are the ways that I think we can really assist both our partners, but also the, the insurance community to understand that kind of that rear facing, oh, an incident happened, we're going to add yet another question to the questionnaire, as opposed to this is what we're doing to manage evolving risk and showing how to effectively do that by utilizing tools that are in place today. But would, um, and I may be uh, a little ahead of ourselves, but I would think with the integration of the output of these things, both on the, on the continuous monitoring and alerting side, and then on the risk assessment uh, questions and activities, combined with your questionnaire, a lot of that work is, uh, if you will, pre-done because of those outputs bought for the MSP uh, in order to get the final steps done to get to insurance. Is that not right? Yes, I think that is right. And what I think is effective, especially when we have these conversations, and I, especially with the MSPs who say, and I am asked every day, multiple times a day, to fill out these questionnaires for my customers. And you, if you talk to people who, attorneys who support MSPs particularly, they'll be like, do not do that. You can have them fill it out and say, yes, I agree with what you're doing. What you've said is true. But there's also that liability line of demarcation. So it, it, I think it allows to align to not overstepping in the liability area, but keeping in the lane of these are the things I do for you. And here's how we are proving what we're doing, how, how we are effectively managing, and how we're managing evolving risk. And I think that if we look at, again, that protect, detect, response line, to be able to show how that aligns to the security posture and the security stack, these products do X, Y, and Z. You know, we protect with MFA, but we detect with this, that you can actually show the stack working in that line, and then how that applies to really what an insurance company needs to know. Are, are you a good driver? Do you not speed too much? Do you not break too hard? All the things that we know result in incidents, those are the things that we can align to that type of security posture and, and the implementation of the tools and the monitoring that's there. Yeah, and, and if you're setting up the types of notifications and, and workflows and such we were talking about, the, the end client has the information they need to intelligently uh, get some of this information themselves without necessarily having to burden you both with the the workload and potential liability of saying here fill out this questionnaire for us you know matt we did get a question somebody said you know i'm an msp that 90 percent of our business is it oriented and 10 percent is cyber security offerings how do we transition you know to flip that around so 90 percent are cyber security solutions so the, the way I would frame this is they're, they're at this point not separate disciplines. Um, cybersecurity, you can't be responsibly managing IT without a cybersecurity component that's part of it. And, and so the, the way that I would suggest that is to, to almost stop thinking of cybersecurity as a separate service and become what, what I would call a security focused MSP, right? So if you're managing a client's environment, Part of the discussion when when the call says, "Hey, we want to implement a new application, or we want to do remote access, or whatever it is," there's a security component to that, and the conversation goes around, "How do you get where you want to be securely?" And it's just assumed that that becomes part of your recommendations when you're making them and when you're implementing something, rather than thinking of security as a discrete thing that's bolted on at the end, either by you or by another provider. Uh, you know, whether you outsource that portion or whether you outsource the monitoring of it, or what have you. Um, security at this point is a core part of IT. And I, I can't imagine in many cases where I would be comfortable taking on the IT portion only 
of the environment or even really the security portion only of the environment that the reality is um, one organization or, or one individual or one entity needs to be driving the IT decision and conversation and security is just a part of that security is not a separate discipline yeah the practicality is I think a lot of what this question this this person just asked right 90 percent of their business is IT support and 10 percent of it is cybersecurity support um, even though we may say you can't really do IT without some cybersecurity, but even, you know, Alan Alford, we had him on a year and a half, you know, almost a year and a half ago, used to talk about the three legs of the stool and at a minimum, you better be doing continuous monitoring. You better have mm -hmm. MFA and you better be doing some cyber education at a very minimum to get started. Um, as an MSP you ought to be providing that for all your clients. And if your clients don't want those three things, you might want to think about, you know, not supporting that client because you're just setting themselves up for, hey, I thought you were providing that for me. So, yeah, uh, it makes for an interesting uh, dialogue. So we don't have any more oh, questions. And if I, if oh. I could just add one more thing to that, yeah. which is it, for, for organizations or MSPs who are in specific disciplines, let's say it could be backup and infrastructure or things like that that are, are specific or a little bit more general that then part of that implementation would be continuous scanning of those backups to ensure there's no malware and remediation around that. So to your point, there, there, there's always a way to insert something that we know could be a primary risk around that particular type of service or support. If it's just support organizations that aren't doing like additional software implementations or so on, that there are always ways to work those things in that when one were to think about, well, what's the primary risk these organizations might have broadly? just to take like one of those pieces in to, to be able to add, add that layer of security in. Kirsten, your, your answer prompted a question that I've seen come up a, a few times, and that is if you are an MSP with a client that doesn't want to implement the MFA or, or do some other security best practice, have, have those, you know, sign this waiver things ever actually been tested in, in court or coverage, or are they really just uh, kind of sell snake oil? It's a it's a really good question. Um, the The way I've seen this, especially for MSPs, is that you can have limitations of damages, and and those waivers go into the MSA documents specifically for um, between the client, and so those are defensible. So if you have an organization that says, "Look, I refuse refuse MFA." And you can certainly put in, you know, you're probably not insurable and we're not accepting responsibility for that. But if you were to have an incident, you know, not related to something, you can actually even carve that out. There are carve outs for specific um, items. The other is, is to say then the limit, the maximum damages you can get would be two months worth of services or something. Right. So there, there's this balance between those two. And certainly counsel who helps support the drafting of those contractual documents could weigh in. But those are the things that I've, I've heard as suggestions to help create limitation of liability while, while dealing with some of the, the absolutes that become much more challenging to have, even though much like you know, riding a roller coaster, you accept the risk of riding a roller coaster. Um, those, are, those are the components that people can work in. And, and I would say that those become then addendum clauses to an MSA document where there could be a waiver or something else. And, and your counsel could advise you on how to add that into your documentation. I guess to that point, do you see, I mean, we suggest it all the time, you know, to MSPs that if your clients are not going to do these five things to provide you the appropriate output of continuous monitoring, continuous scanning, you know, immediate alerts, you should probably think about dropping that client, right? Or tell that client if they're not going to do it, you're not interested in supporting them because your your potential business risk is too high. Um, do you think we're going to see more and more of that happen where the MSBs are going to stand up and say, look, there's more clients than we can service and support anyway. Let's make sure we have ones that are at least, you know, meeting the requirements and falling in line with at, at a minimum what we find to be the minimum threshold yeah right i mean from from my perspective it became part of 
onboarding processes, right? There were some things that were completely non-negotiable during onboardings, and that was MFA for 365 and, and you know some other really bare minimum things like that. And I personally do think you should be taking a hard stance on things like that, simply not accepting uh, environments that aren't willing to meet those bare minimums, such as continuous monitoring and MFA and just the, the absolute necessities for security. And it, it depends on where you are in the business cycle, whether that's something you can tolerate or not. If you're just starting out and you're talking about client number one or client number two, you may have to take on somebody who you wouldn't otherwise do. But, um, you know, if you're you're a little past that, then I'm, I'm of the camp of don't take them on, don't support them if they're not willing to at least put some effort into it. It'll be an antagonistic relationship the whole way down, especially if you as the MSP are actively working at becoming more security focused, it'll put you completely at odds with a client who doesn't see the technology or have that vision. Well, we're just seeing it all the time with, uh, you know, auto dealerships and boat dealerships and, and uh, uh, different dealerships that have to now meet the FTC safeguard requirement by December 9th. You know, these are things that you have to do and you have to do it on a continuous, regular basis. You can't do it as a snapshot once in time just to meet the compliance requirement, meet the regulatory and safeguard requirement and say, you know, we got there in September, but we're not there in October, right? You, they need to do it on an ongoing, continuous basis. Otherwise, they don't meet the requirements. And I think you're going to see more and more of that happen with the insurance industry as well. The I think the insurance industry is going to hold people accountable to, did you do what you say you did? You know, getting back to the questionnaire where you check boxes that said you had things in place, but you actually didn't. Yeah. So, and sometimes you think they do, right? And that's and, and that's the verification piece. And, and ultimately, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, trust but verify, right? And that's that's really where we're going to come down to. Perfect. Well, look, we got a couple minutes left. Um, if we could just, well, let's pull up. We've got these two events coming up. Um, we'd like you to, if you get a chance, participate on Thursday. If you have any questions about the increased compliance issues that are coming on and the cyber attacks, uh, we're fortunate enough to have Dave Sobel from the MSP radio with us and Chris Weiser, who uh, is the CEO of Seven Figure MSP that has, uh, um, you know, about a thousand different MSPs involved in his program. It'll be good to get his perspective on those type of activities as to how the MSP landscape is changing based on the compliance requirements, the regulatory requirements. And then we'll do a demo on the 29th uh, for anybody that has any questions uh, or questions from one of our partners. Um, with that, you know, Matt, maybe I'll go back to you for kind of a couple of closing remarks. Then we'll let Kirsten, we'll let you give a couple of closing remarks and we'll wrap this up. Yeah, so so thanks for, for having me. And I think the, the overall theme, and if one thing that is taken away from this, is the importance of true continuous generation and monitoring for these type of things. And, you know, like, like I mentioned before, it, it's one of those rare items that helps you both from a security and a regulatory perspective. You really are better off in both arenas from doing that. And right now it's a, it's a nice to have in some cases a bonus, but like we were just mentioning, um, in some cases it's required and I think it'll be required in basically all cases for now. So if, if you're in the, the MSP space, we'll be thinking about that and be thinking about how to educate your clients both on the the upcoming needs for things like that and just the difference between security and compliance now they can improve both of them kirsten thanks so much for joining us any uh, closing thoughts you have just now more than ever right it's it's really a, a significant opportunity i know it feels overwhelming but there are ways to help evolve into being able to provide these level of services but it's not going away it's going to become more prevalent. And so just now more than ever, lean into it and, and start working with your customers to realize how important this is and, and what a difference it can make to help them grow and scale their businesses. Well, look, 
I want to thank you both for your time today, Matt. It's always a pleasure to do these with Gradient. I look forward to the one we're going to do next month. Uh, I love the one we did on assessments last month, today on insurance. Great to have an, you know, an industry icon like Kirsten here with us to talk about the cyber insurance industry and where it's going. Uh, we'll look forward to having everybody involved in the future activities. Uh, please go to our LinkedIn page if you have any additional questions that you want to post. Uh, there, there will be a recording of this. We will get the recording out. We'll get the recording posted on our YouTube channel as well for anybody that missed it. Uh, and as always, if you ask us any follow on questions, we will respond to those questions as well as put you in touch with our speakers uh, if you have any additional questions for them. So with that, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday uh, with Dave Sobel and with Chris Weiser. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.